She says, Michael, um, your, your, your grandfather is not doing well. He's 92, right? It would be so terrific though, if, if before he died, he could turn on the television and see you doing something that looked like work. <laughs> Here we are in the Sunday special with Mike Rowe. We'll get to talking with him. He's the host of Dirty Jobs and the way I heard it, it'll be awesome. But first, let's talk about your impending death. So you're going to die sometime soon. Maybe not that, so hopefully it'll be decades. But when you do, you're gonna feel bad because you didn't have life insurance. 71% of people say they need life insurance. Only 59% of people have coverage. That means at least 12% of people are procrastinating. And sure, normally procrastinating is a bad thing. But if you've been avoiding getting life insurance, procrastinating may actually have worked in your favor this time because you're not dead. And while you were putting it off, Policy Genius was making it easy. So Policy Genius, it's the easy way to compare life insurance online. You can compare quotes in just five minutes. When it's that easy, putting it off becomes a lot harder. You can compare quotes while you're sitting on the couch. You can do it while you're listening to this podcast. Try it. Policy Genius has helped over 4 million people shop for insurance, placed over $20 billion in coverage. They don't just make life insurance easy. They also compare disability insurance and renter's insurance and health insurance. If you care about it, they can cover it. So if you need life insurance, but you've been putting it off because it's all a little too confusing or you don't have the time, Check out Policy Genius. It's the easy way to compare top insurers and find the best value for you. No sales pressure, zero hassle, and it's free. PolicyGenius.com. When it's this easy to compare life insurance, there's no reason to put it off. Well, Mike, thanks so much for coming by. Really appreciate it. That was terrific. Thank you. Honestly. You're the first person who's ever praised the ads at the beginning of the show, so thank you for that. Procrastination is the thief of time. I really thought you were going to sneak it in there with that, but kidding aside, I, I love... I love that there's no daylight between you and the people who make the program possible. It's, it's refreshingly, uh, dare I say, authentic. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Because usually what I get is, how dare you interrupt these great conversations with your money grabs? And then I have to remind people that they're watching the show for free because this is how commerce operates. Yeah, people don't like to be reminded of that. You see the filthy lucre somehow pollutes what would otherwise be a really wonderful series of observations. But now I'm afraid we can't take you seriously because somebody somewhere has decided to give you some money. I, strange times, Ben. So folks, you can see why I love Mike Rowe just from the outset here. But let's start from the beginning. So you now do this podcast that's listened to by tens of millions of people and you have billions. various- Billions. Billions. Okay, billions. People yet unborn. On, on planets that have not yet been reached. And you have the and you have your, your TV shows, which have been wildly popular. You have books. Your mom wrote a book mm. that, you've, that you've been pressing lately yep. uh, all about uh, her, her mom. And yep. that's, that's really fantastic. So how did you get from doing what you were doing when you were 18? Is this what you saw yourself doing when you were 18? How did you get from point A to point B? Wow. <clears throat> how long is the show? It's about an hour or so. Okay, so the short version is I was convinced as a young guy growing up in Baltimore that I would follow in the footsteps of my grandfather who lived right next door. My grandfather was a guy who went to the seventh grade um, and then he went to work. By the time he was 30, he was a master electrician. After that, he mastered every other trade there was. The guy could build a house without a blueprint. He was that guy, had the chip, right? He just knew how to fix stuff, take your watch apart, build your house, do whatever. Um, the uh, handy gene, uh, tragically, is recessive. So past me, I didn't get that. And by the time I was out of high school, I realized that I would have to get a, a different sort of toolbox. Um, I learned to uh, act, sort of. I learned to sing a little bit. And I, I just looked at a completely different way to go. I eventually got into entertainment, kind of Forrest Gumped my way through the whole landscape of narrating. You know, I started narrating when I was really young. If there's a wildebeest, uh, trying to get across the vast reaches of the barren Serengeti, but being slowly eaten <laughs> by crocodiles and, uh, and hyenas, the odds are decent that I'm telling you about it. <laughs> Side note, it never works out for the wildebeest, right? Never leave the herd. <laughs> so I started doing those things, and uh, like Frost says, you know, way leads on to way. And the next thing you know, I'm impersonating a host in front of various cameras for various uh, networks, and one show leads to the next. And by the time I was 42, I realized that impersonating a host, uh, though I'd become somewhat facile at it, was not nearly as rewarding uh, as, as telling the unvarnished truth, which Dirty Jobs was. It wound up being a, a tribute to my granddad. Uh, my, mother, <laughs> my mother called me. Uh, I was working for CBS at the time, 2001. I'm in my cubicle, and she says, Michael, I was hosting a show called Evening Magazine, a terrible show. She says, Michael, um, your, your, your grandfather is not doing well. He's 92, right? I'm like, oh, 
you know, what do you think? She said, maybe another year. It would be so terrific though, if, if before he died, he could turn on the television and see you doing something that looked like work. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother calls me out when I'm about 42. Uh, Dirty Jobs began as a special for my granddad. People saw it, 10,000 letters came in. You should meet my granddad, brother, uncle, cousin, sister, aunt, uncle, right? And, uh, and so for 12 years, I went around the country uh, profiling real people who do real jobs that typically unfold in real towns you can't find on a map. And that gave me a certain um, notoriety in cable TV. And Way continued to lead on to Way, and uh, a lot of other great things have happened. I have a foundation now that focuses on closing the skills gap, and uh, the uh, podcast you mentioned has been so much fun. It's a writing exercise. It helps pass the time on planes. They're short stories told in the style of Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story. And uh, while I would never imagine for a moment I could, uh, I could fill his shoes, it's been fun trying to follow in his footsteps. Well, it's, it's all really fun stuff to listen to and certainly fun stuff to watch, but it's also really meaningful because you're one of the few people in the entertainment industry who, who really does take seriously the stuff that people in the middle of the country are doing. And as the country sort of polarizes between the folks who are in the entertainment sphere or the journalism sphere or the, the sort of high IQ is how they would term themselves sphere, uh, and the people who are actually working the jobs that actually get things done across the country, uh, that that's a voice that seems to have been lost a lot. What do you think is, do you think that's a, that's a really serious gap? And do you think that's a bridgeable gap? Or is that is that gap between sort of the people who deem themselves to be smart and the people who deem themselves to be doing the jobs that matter? Right. Is, that, is that destined to sort of increase as time goes on here? Well, there's always been a gap, right? Sometimes it's wide, sometimes it's less wide. Um, and we all fall in love with the romantic version of ourselves, right? Whether you're a journalist or whether you're an actor, whether whatever it is you think you are and whoever it is you think you are, that becomes, you become the sun in your own solar system. So you, everything else is just a planet in orbit, right? So I think with regard to the skills gap and regard to really any gap, it's all just symptomatic of a series of what I would call disconnects. We've become uh, slowly and inexorably and profoundly disconnected from a lot of very basic things that when I grew up, I was really connected to, like where my food comes from, where my energy comes from, uh, basic history, basic curiosity, you know, uh, the things that fundamentally allow us to assume a level of appreciation that in my view is the best way to bridge those gaps. If we don't have appreciation, right? If we're not, if we're not blown away by the miracle that occurs when you flick the switch and the lights come on, if we're not gobsmacked by flushing the toilet and seeing all of it go away, <laughs> right? If, when we start losing our appreciation for those things, the gap deepens. And I think the gap right now is, um, well, it's extraordinary. There's 6.3 million jobs that are available as we speak. Um, we have 75% uh, of those jobs that don't require a four-year degree. And yet, we're still pushing the four-year degree as the best path for the most people. And it just happens to be the most expensive path. And a lot of people, as you describe, who are kind of in the middle, have enough common sense to realize that $1.5 trillion in outstanding student loans is a version of lending money we don't have to kids who can't pay it back to train for jobs that don't exist anymore. And that's crazy. So, you know, I think there's great um, common sense that is still alive and well in a lot of people. And I think that as they look at the headlines, they're frustrated. And uh, to be fair, I think people on the coasts uh, are coming at it from their own bias and they're frustrated. And so a lot of frustrated people are talking really loud uh, past each other. And uh, a lot of truths uh, are inconvenient for a lot of people. And so it just gets noisy, which is a long way of saying, no, I, I don't think the gap will ever close. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't. But but I'm not freaked out by that. Mm -hmm. Because I think the, the point is Sisyphean. The point is quixotic. 
Right. So do you, let, let's talk about the college thing for a minute, because let's say that you're somebody who's thinking about going to college. Under what conditions do you think somebody ought to go to college? And as somebody who was a poli sci major, which is about the most useless degree you can have outside of like lesbian dance theory or something, uh, then I minored in that. So <laughs> please, <laughs> if you know, poli sci is basically so you can go to law school. That's that's all poli sci sure. is, and that, this is true for what we at UCLA called North Campus majors, right? All North Campus majors was like English and poli sci, all the liberal arts. Like, all this stuff was prep for grad degrees. Uh, or for getting a low-level job at a newspaper or something like that. The South Campus majors, the people who are in the sciences and maths, those people were actually doing something useful. Who do you think ought to go to college, especially because there is a concomitant worry that if you don't go to college and you go for one of these blue-collar jobs that you're talking about that don't necessarily require a four-year degree, that those are going to get automated in the, in the near future. Do you, sure. What do you think the threat of that is? And you have an 18-year-old kid. Do you tell them to go to college or not? Concomitant college word, right? Mm -hmm. I'd have gone with contemporaneous, but either way, <laughs> either way, those two C words lead to the other C word, which is curiosity. No, not that one. Curiosity, <laughs> right? I mean, look, anybody who's curious and who can afford it should go to college. The thing that I deal with most often with my foundation, which focuses primarily on jobs that don't require a four-year degree that actually exist, uh, when I come out in favor of those opportunities, uh, what comes back over the net usually with a lot of top spin, is the accusation that I'm anti-college or anti-education. I'm not. My liberal arts degree served me really, 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 really well. I got it in 1984. It was the product of a two-year community college and then another couple of years at a university. And when the dust settled, the whole bill was $9,800. Same exact thing today is 88 grand, right? So my answer to your question is, A, can you afford it? If you can't, don't. Now that doesn't mean don't borrow money, but if you don't, if you're not afflicted with a passion for the major and you have to borrow 20, 30, 50, 80, hundred thousand dollars in order to pursue the thing you may or may not be truly passionate about, then I, I don't know what to say to you other than that has to be a function of either peer pressure parental pressure, or really bad guidance counseling. Because I, I get it, it's not fair to compare a liberal education to workforce development, right? But at some point, the only four letter word that truly matters is debt. And you can either do it or, or you can't. I'll say this too, um, you know, when I went to school, part of what you paid for was access. A big part of what you paid for, right? All this information exists in obviously libraries, but mostly in the minds of professors and you get access. You sit in front of them and you, and you learn. Well, you know, we have in our pockets right now a device that gives us access to 98% of the known information in the world. You can watch lectures from MIT and Yale and Dartmouth, and William and Mary and all the great schools for free. I'm not saying it's the same thing. I'm just saying that the cost of college is unconscionable. And, and to, to say that questioning it is somehow fundamentally, um, uh, you know, out of bounds, I, I just think it's the, it's the height of hubris. So what, what do we do? Uh, there, there's a lot of talk, particularly on both sides of the political aisle right now, about the, about the sort of falling down of American industry, supposedly. This idea that manufacturing is going away, we're moving toward a service economy, that a lot of these jobs are eventually going to be automated or outsourced. What do we say to people who may not want to go to college, may want to get one of these jobs, worries that 10 years from now, they're going to be basically priced out of the market by, they, they want to be a trucker, and now there's going to be Google trucks on the roads. What, what do we do about that? Is there a solution to that, or is it just a matter of human beings have to be adaptable? That, you know, I mean, look, when my grandfather saw me mess up the foundation and hang the drywall, not plumb. You know, he was, he was very nice, but eventually, eventually, he just said, look, you know, you can be a tradesman if you want to, you just need a different toolbox. And it was really wonderful advice in hindsight. You know, the idea that I could work in Hollywood like an electrician, you know, the ultimate freelance, really. By the way, the, uh, the origins of that word, you're familiar with freelance? No. It was literally a free lance in medieval days. You know, you're a knight who served 
whoever hired you. You're a mercenary. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, if you have a skill, you can do that because the skill goes wherever you go. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> the question was, what do we do about the manufacturing jobs that, that could be disappearing? Is it something that the government can solve? Are we is it a trade problem? Is it a technology problem? Or is it just going to have to be people adjusting as, as time goes on? What if it's not a problem at all? What if it's simply the oldest story in the world? I mean, I'm not a history major, but I, I read about the Luddite revolution. I read about what happened in textiles. I read about the advent of looms and what that meant. It was the same exact argument then. Everybody always says it's different this time. And maybe it is. I don't know. But everybody always says it's different, and it almost never is. In fact, I don't think it's ever been different. So I don't know. I don't know what's... Uh, can I envision a time when driverless cars and pilotless planes are going all around? I, I suppose I could. Do I think we'll live to see it? I don't think so. I think we might, I think you might see a truck driving down the highway in the next 20 years that's being, com that's completely automated. But I also think you're going to see a human sitting behind the wheel. So, okay. So, you, so you're, you're just optimistic in general about the possibility that, that a lot of these jobs will continue to exist because there's a lot of pessimism from people like, uh, for example, we had Aaron, Eric Weinstein from, uh, the, from Peter Thiel's company yeah. last week. And he was deeply concerned about the possibility, as a lot of people are, that a lot of these blue collar jobs are just going to go away and you're going to have to end up with some sort of universal basic income where people who are not the creatives end up not working but being supported by the creatives because all of these blue collar jobs eventually end up being automated and, and destroyed over time. I want you to answer that. First, I'm going to make an obscene profit pitch. So let's do that. With all the recent news about online security breaches, it's hard not to worry about where my data goes. Making an online purchase, simply accessing your email could put your private information at risk. You're being tracked online by social media sites, marketing companies, your mobile or internet provider. Not only can they actually record your browsing history, they often sell it to other corporations who would like to profit from that information, which is why I've taken my privacy back using ExpressVPN. You do need a VPN, and ExpressVPN is the best. They have easy-to-use apps that run seamlessly. In the background of your computer, phone, and tablet, you turn on ExpressVPN with one click. And ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data, hiding your public IP address. Protecting yourself with ExpressVPN, it costs less than seven bucks a month. ExpressVPN is rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So, if you ever use public Wi-Fi and you want to keep hackers and spies from seeing your data, ExpressVPN is the solution. And if you don't want to hand over your online history to internet providers or data resellers, ExpressVPN is the answer. Protect your online activity today. Find out how you can get three months for free at expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben. You get three months free with a one-year package. Expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Okay, so to just restate the question for those who forgot it during that ad, uh, the, basic, the basic question was, a lot of folks right now on both sides of the aisle are worried about the bifurcation of an economy where it becomes in what they're calling now an IQ economy. The idea that if you are a creative type, if you're somebody who can do stuff that machines can't do, that artificial intelligence can't do, you'll have a job in the future and, you will, and, and your job will be relatively safe. And if you are somebody who is working as a truck driver, that you're basically going to be screwed and there isn't going to be a lot of job opportunity available to you. Do you think that's something that's not going to happen? Or if it does happen, is there a solution like universal basic income that people are talking about? That's beyond my pay grade. I personally, I'm very suspicious of that simply because I, you might solve a financial problem, but I think you're going to create some unintended consequences by essentially telling people that here's a big pile of something that you need and you don't have to do anything for it. I just think on a really fundamental primal level, uh, you're moving the cheese. And I, I don't know what's going to come out the other side, but I, I just can't imagine it's going to be good. You said bifurcated, right? I mean, I, yes. I, I think it's binary. It's splitting it. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a false choice. You know, I think, I, I think heads and tails are always going to be on the same coin. And this idea, this idea that you're an artistic uh, left brain person over here or this non-artistic right brain or I, I, what is that? You know, I remember in the election, um, I think it was Rubio who, 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 who talked about um, more welders, less philosophers, which is very much in keeping with, with what my foundation says, right? But only on a, on a practical need. But I, but I objected to the idea that a welder can't quote Nietzsche or Descartes. Right. I mean, I, I, I object to the idea that a philosopher can't run an even bead down a seal. 
This idea that it's one or the other is a, is a very limited toolbox kind of thought. And I think what you said before is, is, is exactly right. The answer to that question is purely adaptive. It, it, our ability to adapt and to think more broadly and to take more advantage of the unlimited access that we all have to the same bottomless compendium of knowledge and to be excited by it, to explore that. I just think part of the solution has to start with curiosity. It has to. The, I don't have a magic eight ball and I have no idea what's truly coming and I would never want to pretend to. But just because I can't tell you why I think we're going to be okay yeah. doesn't mean we're not. Mm -hmm. We're going to figure it out because we always have. And I'm just very suspicious of the argument that says this, this time we won't. It's just too complicated. One of the things that, that troubles me is when I look at the, the political, because I do politics all day, right? So when, when I look at the political situation, what I see from both sides is this tendency toward seeing yourself as a victim of general trends. So on the one side, you have people who say, we're victims of racism or institutional privilege. And on the other side, you have people saying, we're victims of foreign trade and we're victims of economic development. And people who say you should put your own house in order first seem to be getting a lot of flack for that. So as an example, my friend Kevin Williamson wrote for National Review. He wrote a piece specifically about some of these dying towns in the Rust Belt mm -hmm. uh, that were very heavily based on manufacturing and factory work. And he wrote this piece basically saying that if your town is dying and you're sitting there waiting for your job to come back, you're being a fool, leave the town. It goes somewhere else. And it got all sorts of blowback as somebody who's supposedly looking down his nose at the working class. And Kevin grew up so poor that his mom was stealing hangers from motels when he was a kid. Yeah. Uh, is that something that we as a people can overcome or is this just endemic to human nature that we're always going to blame everybody else for our own problems? Yeah. We're always going to blame people for our problems. I mean, I think, I think that's how we start. I think, you know, I mean, we don't come into the world, uh, in my view, as pure as we're often told. I mean, you have kids, right? I mean, you, you've got two kids sitting next to each other. One's three, one's two. They're playing. This one wants that toy. This one doesn't want to give the toy up. So the Story one moves over and takes the toy, maybe bashes the over one over the head. I mean, this, this is, you know, we come in covetous. We want we take, it, whatever it is, it can't be our fault. We're, we're the sun in our solar system. We're, we're the center of our universe, you know? How do we realize that we're not, you know? It's kind of a clunky analogy, but, but whatever it is that allows us to assume in our infancy that there's this, somehow the, the universe has come around us to take care of us, that translates to this idea that my town can't die. My job can't go away. I had it and now it's gone. And so time out, party foul, not cool, right? It's, it's, and, and so it's, I don't mean at all to make light of it. And I read the article that you're talking about. He got, he got creamed for that. Destroyed, and, then he yeah. got, and then he got creamed again. Yeah, exactly. By cream cream, right? <laughs> but look, we're <laughs> outrageous for sale. Everybody knows, uh, no one knows it better than you, I don't think. Uh, but um, finding a way to talk about that issue, uh, along with many others, that doesn't immediately alienate half the country is the thing that I look at as a challenge every single day. It's what I do on my Facebook page. It's what I do with my foundation. It's what I try and do on shows like this. I've spent a lot of time on MSNBC, CNN, Fox. I'll talk to anybody who wants to have a a fun, lighthearted, yet grown-up conversation. And no matter where I go, people's heads explode. There was a week a few years ago where I, <laughs> I did, I went on uh, Glenn Beck, and then two days later, I went on Bill Maher. You know, I had three million friends on Facebook at the time. A couple weeks later, I had two million. You know, my buddies on the right just simply didn't know what to do with the optics of me sitting next to Bill Maher. And my pals on the left just had no notion of how to square the cognitive dissonance that forced their heads to explode when they saw me sitting there with Glenn Beck. Just didn't know what to do it. It'll happen here. It happens every six months, right? So what I'm saying is we're in the world now where it's not, it's not what we say that gets us in trouble. It's what we don't. 
And it's not where we are that makes people's eyebrows arch, it's who we're sitting next to. We're all, it's, 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 it's the proximity of outrage, right? It's the geography of all of it. What, what do you think has changed about that? Because I, I remember five years ago, I used to speak on college campuses and I didn't require any security. The outrage industry was there, obviously, but it wasn't nearly at the tenor that it is now, where people are digging through things people said 10 years ago to try and find the one thing they said that they can get them fired over. And obviously, you know, now when I go and speak at Berkeley, I require 600 police officers. It, wh wh where did all of this come from? Like, I just don't, I don't remember, I remember people being very angry during the Bush administration. I don't remember it being anywhere near like this, the level of anger that's in the society. Is that something, people have attributed that to economics, people have attributed that to, to cultural splits. Wh where do you think that, that that anger is coming from? Well, look, I, I hate to say it, but I, I think part of it is social. I mean, I have a show now on Facebook. I'm thrilled to be on that platform. And my show is a celebration of bloody do-gooderism. Um, but I also own guns, right? Social is a tool. Guns are a tool. And we're right on the verge, I think, of discovering some really interesting parallels between the First and Second Amendment. And I think, uh, I think people are, people who would never, ever consider uh, or associate a firearm with goodness are ironically using speech as a, as a real cudgel uh, and restricting it in, in so many ways. The arguments are really interesting, you know, and if, if you look at social uh, as a weapon, then it's a weapon that you have. You don't need a license for it. Anybody can have it. The question is, is how are you, how are you gonna use it? And most people simply don't have the training or the maturity to handle it. And so the violence and the anger and the outrage that you're seeing, uh, I think in part is a result of having an unlimited amount of access to a platform that gives you both uh, the mechanism to say whatever you want and the anonymity and the comfort to hide behind it. And so people are very shrill and they're very brave uh, in, that, in, in, in those scenarios. And look, all of that is just the portent to a, to a mob. It all leads to sort of mob mentality. And I think that's what you've probably, you've probably seen. Things get accelerated, and then there's no place left for it to go, and so they have to act out. Yeah, conversations get shut down. It really is, it's, it's deeply unfortunate. I, I also think that, you know, that with the rise of the social media and with the rise of the technology, I think there's something else that's happened too. And I don't know where you are religiously or where you get your values from, but I feel like there's a dramatic lack of central values in people's lives. The people are, are now looking for value in the anger. The people feel fulfilled because they're angry. And the angrier you are, the more fulfilled you are. The more it shows that you're an authentic human being if you're angry. If you, if you quell that anger and actually have a regional, reasonable conversation with someone, this means you're inauthentic. It means that you're hiding what you truly feel. But if you're really pissed off, yeah. That means that you are an authentic, decent human being. And so the more angry and indecent you are, the more decent you are by this, by this perverse logic. Where do you think people ought to get their values? I mean, your, your value is very practically based. Is it just from how you grew up? How, is, it, is it from a religious background? Where does that come from? I think, you know, it's a nature-nurture question, right? I mean, obviously it has a lot to do with how you're raised. But in the end, you, you have to hit the reset button and really decide for yourself, not just what you think, but, but why. Uh, this confusion between uh, passion and um, uh, conviction. What is the, there's a line, I think it was Yates at the end of uh, the, best, the, the best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. intensity. Yep. Right? So that's it. If you don't have the certainty of your convictions, if you can't make a case, uh, if you can't answer the question, you just ask me, which I'll try and get to in a sec, then, then what is left? You know, nothing is left but an explanation of how you feel. And so if your philosophy ultimately redounds to an explanation of how you feel, then you're completely beholden to whatever feeling you might be experiencing at any given point. And then you're just one of those people who follow their passion, right? Good luck with that, right? <laughs> um, personally, I, my philosophy uh, has a lot to do with being suspicious of anything that feels easy. 
just as a, as a general rule, being wary of all uh, earnestness. In the words of Travis McGee, John D. McDonald, one of my favorite fictitious characters who in hindsight actually formed the basis of my entire uh, business model. Um, and, uh, and gratitude, you know, a good natured skepticism, a ton of gratitude, and uh, you know, some honest intellectual curiosity will probably be the best replacements, at least that I can think of, for getting right to the point of, let me tell you how I feel, right? I, 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 I really don't care how you feel, honestly. I mean, over a beer, it's kind of fun. You're to talking talk my language right here. I just don't care. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so much more in interesting to understand why you believe what you believe than it is to hear about what you believe. And that's why mobs are boring, and that's why protests are tiresome, because all the placards just simply say, this is how I feel, and this is what I believe. Okay, well, I want to talk in, in a second about some of the practical, hard-headed advice that you have Are you, you going to do that thing people. again? Where you, where you, oh, I, you bet. I can't wait. You bet. It's happening right now. Get ready for it. I'm ready. I'm going to But first, let's talk about your sleep. We're never going to agree on everything, but I think we can all agree that we can use more sleep. Getting a great night's sleep is easier and more affordable than you actually think. You don't need a new expensive mattress or sleeping pills. You need to change your sheets. That's why you should check out Bull & Branch. Everything Bull & Branch makes, from its bedding to blankets, it's pure 100% organic cotton. It means they start out super soft, and then they get even softer over time. You buy directly from them, so you're essentially paying wholesale prices. Luxury sheets can cost up to 1000 bucks in the store. Bull & Branch sheets, just a couple of hundred bucks. Everybody who tries Bull & Brand Sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands of five-star reviews and Forbes, Wall Street Journal, Fast Company. They're all talking about Bull & Branch. Even three U.S. presidents sleep on Bull & Brand Sheets. Shipping is free. You can try them for 30 nights, so no risk. If you don't love them, send them back for a refund. But you're not going to want to send them back. There's no risk, no reason not to give them a try. To get you started right now, my listeners get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets at bullandbranch.com. Promo code Ben Guest because I have a guest. Go to bullandbranch.com today for 50 bucks off your first set of sheets. That's B O L L and branch.com. Promo code Ben Guest. Bullandbranch.com. Promo code Ben Guest. All right, well, we're back, and I can feel my wallet just got this much fatter I just because gave it of away. what just happened. Yeah, and, and, and mine is gone uh, because, because I keep buying everything you're selling. Well, I mean, this is, this is how I make my money, so I'm glad. If I, can, if I can get Mike Rowe to fall for my advertisements, I mean, I, I can get ben, anyone. Ben, how, how many times are you accused of selling out? Uh, on this Sunday special, like every Twitter, every comment on the YouTube video below, every single one. I see. Well, okay, so. <laughs> People say when I run for president that my inauguration will begin fellow Americans, but first an ad from Birch Gold. Like this is, this is really what all the comments say below this video right here, right now. So I get it. I get it every week, right? It's just a people, it's a, their heads explode when they, when this weird mix of like, like commerce and art, dare we say art, you know, collide. They come together in this happy nexus of serendipity. And yet it's, it's mind boggling to people. My first job in TV was at a home shopping channel. I sold out before I had anything to, to bargain. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was serious before when I said I, I really applaud what you're doing because it is, you, this show is utterly without pretense. I have no idea what you're going to ask me next. And the only thing more liberating than that is I'm convinced that you don't either. Except we're going to stop every 15 seconds to take care of the brute realities of keeping these... Are these lights? Yeah, they are. I Keeping think, yeah. these lights on. And so, look, I, I, you used the word authenticity before in a couple of different ways. I think it's one of the most important concepts going right now because the country starved for it, starved for it. But we're not quite sure what it is. But it has something to do with the way you're doing this. Well, I thank you. I appreciate that. I think that the, the authenticity break is actually... It has something to do with the election of President Trump, I think, to get political. You know, the, we would rather have an authentic quasi-con man in the White House than we would have an inauthentic harpy like, like Hillary Clinton. We, we would much rather have somebody who is actually the person that he says he is. Like, everybody knows what Trump is at this point. Everything is baked into the cake with President Trump because, we, because he's just out there about it. Like, it, pretty much you could hit him with anything at this point, and he would probably survive it. He's like a cockroach after a nuclear explosion. He's going to survive it. And that's not, that's meant in the best possible way. He is a political, I mean, when I say cockroach after a nuclear explosion, I don't mean that as bad as it sounds. I mean that it's, it's a quality in a politician that is hard to come by. Bill Clinton had it too. But the, the, this sort of feeling like, 
we, we can trust you because we know that what you're saying is what you actually believe is something that that is is really effective right now, given sure. how produced everything is. And because everybody is so afraid of these social media mobs, authenticity is in short supply. What do you make of, of Trump? How did he come about? And and what, what have you made of him so far? So, I mean, it's the question on everybody's mind. On every, I understand he's the sun around which the universe apparently right now, revolves. Yeah. Look, I was on I was invited on Meet the Press the Sunday after the election. And they asked me that same question because a couple weeks earlier, I was asked that question on Facebook and I answered it very candidly. I said, he's going to win. I said, he's going to win running away. I wish I'd listened to you. I lost a bunch of money on the election. No, there was no doubt about it. I mean, for me, look, I had just spent 10 years in Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, all through it. You know, I mean, it was, to me, from what I saw, it was obvious. Um, but uh, I'll tell you my Trump story. All right. I mean, I've got a, I've got a few of them, but <laughs> but the one that was public, um, I raised money for my foundation in a lot of unorthodox ways. You know, for years I had these things called crap auctions, collectibles, rare and precious. And I, I would I would go in my garage and I would take out a piece of crap that uh, I'd accumulated in my dirty travels. Right. And I would sell it in the QVC style and. I'd give the money we raised to the foundation. We raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when the election was at its fevered pitch, um, I had a show on uh, CNN at the time called Somebody's Got to Do It. And uh, the show is no longer on CNN. It's actually on TBN. I had to move it because it was preempted constantly because the election ramped up in such a way. So I, I went online and I... Uh, and, and basically said to Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders, said, nice going, guys. You just got my show booted off the network. I'll forgive you if each of you will make a donation to my foundation. What I'm looking for from you, Bernie, is your uh, one of those crumpled uh, you know, suit coats you always wear. Send that to me, and I'll auction it off. Hillary, send me one of your pantsuits, right? And I said to Trump, I said, send me one of your bathrobes and an autograph, you know, a bathrobe out of you. So, heard nothing from Bernie Sanders, heard nothing from Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump sent me an autographed bathrobe with his name signed on it. He had it hand delivered to me. So the next, <laughs> the next week, I, I put on his bathrobe and I sit down at my kitchen table. You know, I got my iPhone set up and I'm doing an episode of crap. I auctioned the thing off, got $18,000 for it. <laughs> like that, okay? So I got a lot of heat for wearing a Donald Trump bathrobe. I don't care. The money went straight to the Work Ethics Scholarship Program. The moral of the story is he understands who's watching, and he understands what's happening. It doesn't have anything to do, I, I don't know, I can't speak to his polemics, his politics. I don't need to say anything to get myself in any more hot water. He sent the robe. Nobody else did. And I really, I really didn't expect him to. But a deal's a deal. So I auctioned it off and I thanked him. And the money went to a great cause. My only other interaction with him, um, we got a call months ago uh, from, from the White House to talk about uh, supporting a thing that just happened this week this big initiative around vocational education. Yeah, Ivanka Trump's been pushing that. Yeah, her people called and we, we had a really candid conversation. And look, I'll tell you what I told him. I said, look, I'd, I'd love to. I mean, honestly, I'd love to because what, what you're talking about is the mandate of MicroWorks. It's what I've been, I mean, from the day Barack Obama went in office, uh, we started our foundation uh, Labor Day 2008. We're 10 years this year. And uh, I've been, to the extent that I'm able to call for anything, I've been calling for this exact thing, a PR campaign for good jobs that actually exist, and a genuine focus on alternatives to a four-year education. But I said, look, I, if I put on a Make America Great hat, half the country will not hear me. And so it has nothing to do, forget my personal politics, do what you can politically. What I'm doing now is not political at all. It's one of the few areas I believe right and left still share with these uh, Venn diagrams. 
there's not a lot of shared real estate left, but the definition of a good job in 2018 is something we're all gonna have to figure out. And look, I call them as I see them. What they did this week around the skills gap, as you would say, good Trump. Mm -hmm. Good so, Trump. So what? So tell us a little bit more about vocational training. You know, as somebody who who went to the Tony colleges and and has can barely pick up a hammer. What is what does vocational training actually constitute? Because when I hear it, it sounds like a welding shop class from middle school or something. Mm. Well, what what exactly what exactly is it? And why should people undergo it if they, if they're seeking a job in one of these industries? Vocational training is the is the most direct line you can find uh, between. Uh, where you are now and an actual opportunity. It's, it's job training. It's, it's not esoteric, it's not theoretical. It's, this is what you need to be able to do in order to get money for doing it. It's very, very simple. And it can apply to, it's not just welding and steam fitting and pipe fitting and things like that. It's, there's healthcare areas. There's so many opportunities that require vocational training. But the first thing to understand is what you just said it is exactly right. The language matters. The language matters hugely. And, you know, shop class, we didn't just get shop class out of high school like that. It was a process. Shop used to be called vocational arts. The first thing we did was we took the art out of it, and then we made it vo-tech. And then it was just vocational education. And then eventually it became shop at which point it's easy to walk it out back behind the barn and put a bullet in its head. And that's what we did. We took shop class out of high school. Is there a more persuasive way to show an entire generation of kids what's important than by eliminating it from view? And, well, and the entertainment industry has contributed to this also. I mean, like every joke is always about shop class. Every joke is always about the guy who's the plumber the, the, the ideal that you aspire to if you watch TV is never the person who actually is working one of the jobs that you're talking about. It's always a lawyer or a doctor. Those are the glamorous jobs, apparently. Nobody ever actually talks to a lawyer or a doctor before making a show about lawyers and doctors being glamorous right. jobs because as a lawyer and with a wife as a doctor, it is not a glamorous job, it actually turns yeah. out. Um, but w the entertainment industry obviously circulated in, in New York and LA, made up of a bunch of people like me, people who can't handle a hammer. What does, how does Hollywood contribute to, to this sort of skills gap and, and problem, do you think? Mightily. You know, you're talking about a, uh, a cold war on work, and it's waged on multiple fronts. Hollywood leads the charge, to your point. If there's a plumber on a show, he's 300 pounds with a giant butt crack. That's what plumbers look like, right? All of them are the recipients, not of a skilled trade, but of some kind of vocational consolation prize. It's what you do if you can't do this, right? So that's the working uh, assumption. And Hollywood has uh, confirmed those stigmas and stereotypes in a multitudinous number of ways. Uh, Madison Avenue has done the exact same thing. You see the same portrayals in advertising as you do in popular culture. Books, I mean, look, I, I, I'm pals with Tim Ferriss, but you know, we always laugh and we talk about this because when he published The 4-Hour Workweek, it was one of the first examples I pointed to. This is a great bestseller. It's full of good advice. But the titular promise is how to get so much more by doing so much less. All the propositions on any financial ad that you're ever going to see or read are going to, it's pregnant with the possibility of retiring sooner, working less. If you're unhappy, the proximate cause of your unhappiness probably has to do with your damn boss or your damn job. That's how you make work the enemy. You identify it as the reason for your unhappiness, and then you juxtapose it with all kinds of other images that you, that you can't have, right? And now you, now you have a whole new gap in there. So, my foundation evolved really as a PR campaign for jobs that actually exist and a challenge to this idea that, you know, the most expensive path was the best path for the most people. Um, so, yeah, I, I have lots of opportunities and lots of examples because this town is rife uh, with it. But look, it's everywhere, Ben. It's a, it is on bookshelves. It's on your television. 
And, and, and it's in parents. Look, and, and this goes back. This is the uh, reptilian part of our brain. We, we want something for our kids better than we had. Doesn't matter how good we had it. Doesn't matter. Because we want something better. That's okay. That's, that's normal. But at some point, back to defining what a better job or a good job really is, parents can't agree. Guidance counselors can't agree. Guidance counselors in high schools now, in many cases, are, are evaluated and comped based on their ability to help X number of students matriculate into a four-year school. That's the goal, right? So we've, we've got our thumb on the scale in so many different ways. And ultimately, what we're left with is a giant, hot mess of misunderstanding, myths, stereotypes, and misperceptions that are affirmatively keeping people from pursuing a litany of opportunities. So one of the things that I, I love that you talk about is, is the meaning of work. One, as you say, there are a lot of folks in our society who seem to think that less work is, is better and that retiring early is the thing. And then you see all these people who retire at age 66 and by 68 they're dead. Because if <laughs> you're not miserable. working, then you're not doing anything. I, it's been my view for my entire life that people were legitimately born to work until you die. And even if you don't have work, you find things to work at, whether it's you go and you volunteer somewhere or you're working with a charity. People need to feel purpose and people find purpose in work. But you have, a, you have an interesting perspective on this because the, the way that I was brought up, you know, in, in the schools that I went to, the way that I think people of my generation were brought up is find something that's meaningful and then try to find a job in the thing that you find meaningful. Whereas one of the things you preach is find a job and then try to find meaning in that job, which is kind of the polar opposite. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, Look, I mean, in the end, what you want is meaningful work. And let's define meaningful work as, uh, as an activity that you're passionate about, uh, that moves the needle in, in some way, and that compensates you in a way that excites you. The question is, how do you get there? And today, the path starts with passion. It starts with, well, Sit down and think about it. What would make you happy? Right? What, what do you see yourself as doing? Right? Identify that thing. Now, let's put together a plan. What sort of education do you need? How much time should it take? And you put all these shoulds in front of it, right? And now, and now you have a plan. And when you get to that place, congratulations, you've done it, right? That's insane. Right? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's insane. It's kind of like saying, all right, you want to be happy in your, in, your, in, your, in your love life, all right? Are you going to go in search of your soulmate, or are you going to go uh, where the people are and start getting to know them, right? It just, it just depends on how hard you want to make it. So one of the big lessons from Dirty Jobs was the people on that show collectively were having a much better time than the average person would suspect they would be having, given the fact that most of them were covered in other people's crap, or crawling around in some godforsaken <laughs> pit of despair, or doing some vocational consolation prize thing, right? These people aren't supposed to look happy, they're not supposed to look self-actualized, they're not supposed to look prosperous. The dirty little secret of Dirty Jobs was that easily 40 of the people we featured on that show were multimillionaires. We never talked about it, because I didn't want it to be a, a polemic. But success doesn't look like the version we've been sold at all, at all. So, you know, having fun with that, that kind of cognitive dissonance is, is great. Show, showing people examples of the plumber who began his or her trade with learning a skill and now has seven trucks and 32 employees, that's important. Those people, over and over again, the septic tank inspector up in West Wisconsin, the, the skull cleaners in, in Oklahoma City, I, I can go down the list. None of them set out to do what they were doing. None of them began with, what would make me happy? These people looked around to see where everybody was running, and they ran in the opposite direction. That's where they found opportunity. Then they found a way to get good at it. Then they learned their trade and then they, they mastered it. Then they found a way to be passionate about it. So they got to the same place, but they didn't start 
on this snipe hunt of what will make me happy. They looked around and said, where are the jobs? And they got them. And do you, do you think, weird question for you, do you think that same thing applies in personal relationships? 100%. I think it applies in everything. I think, you know, our brain is obviously our, our, our best friend and our, and our worst enemy. You know, it, it'll, it'll do whatever we tell it to do, right? I mean, if, if, if you assign it a task, it, it's going to go until it can complete it or die trying. Just be careful of what you assign it to. You know, I mean, if you, if you tell your brain the only way you're going to be happy is if you find your soulmate, you better be prepared to embark upon a worldwide, never-ending tour of chronic disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be expensive, right? I'm not saying settle. See, it's another binary choice. This is what people are going to say to me. when They're going to be like, so you're just saying just go back, just what, arranged marriages? Well, I don't know, but statistically, arranged marriages do pretty good, you know? They do pretty good. So I'm not saying that. I'm no, but just, you're, you're right in the sense that, you know, there's, there's always talk about passion nowadays, passion in marriage. And what the social science tends to show is that passion in, in any relationship is that it's very high at the very beginning. And companionate love is that it's very low. And then in very short order, passionate love drops precipitously and companionate love increases precipitously. And so you can bet on passionate love, but no matter how you bet on passionate love, Within a year, that passionate love is going to be declining. The question is whether the companionate love is actually going to last. And so if you go into Time it with... Frame. Exactly. If you go into it with the mentality that this is something you're going to have to stick to, the chances you have a successful marriage are going to be a lot better than I'm going to go into it because I'm passionate about it. Because every job eventually becomes a job. No matter how passionate you are about your initial belief in a job, and I love my job, and I'm sure you love your job, eventually it gets to the point where, yeah, i got to get up this morning, got to go to work. And it's still you're getting up and going to work. Happiness is a... It's a... It's a terrific symptom. I mean, it's a terrible goal, right? It's just a terrible goal because it's a it's a sucker's bet. If it were, if happiness were that tangible, then every then the same thing would make everyone happy. But obviously, it it doesn't, you know. But I just I, I'm sure of that. I'm not sure of much, but I'm. I'm sure of that. I wrote this thing. You'd get a kick out of it. It's a, it started like most everything I do as an attempt to uh, amuse myself. But after a bottle of wine one night, you know, I, my, my foundation awards work ethic scholarships. So we need to have some mechanism by which we can try to account for work. I mean, how do you measure character? It's virtually impossible. But I wrote this thing called a sweat pledge, skills and work ethic are not taboo, aren't taboo, sweat, right? And you have to sign it. It's a 12-point <laughs> pledge, sort of part 12-step process, part scout law, right? And, um, and some people really, really, really hate it. But one of the first things is, you know, you know I'm, I'm grateful. I won the greatest lottery of all time. I, I live in America. Two, I do not follow my passion. Right at three, I mean, it, it goes down all of these things. It was just, it was like a little personal manifesto for me. Uh, but I only bring it up because it's become increasingly more important to my foundation. And now, the more I look back on it, it's hysterical, Ben. How how outraged people get. I give away I mean, maybe five million dollars so far. Right, not a ton by foundation standards, but it's a chunk. It's money, yeah. Every year, about. $800,000 goes out. And um, every year, people say, well, why do I have to sign the sweat pledge? And I said, well, you don't have to. It's entirely possible this particular pile of free money might not be for you. Right? <laughs> and, and, and it goes, whoosh, like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I mean, there are many scholarship funds that award academic achievement. I'm more interested in, in awarding attendance, right? I mean, athletic achievement, uh, talent, there, there are all kinds of rubrics and metrics for measuring value. But where's the work ethic? So that's what we try and do. And forgive me, I, I, I'm trying to bring this back to the answer to the question you posed, but I forgot what it is again. So if I, I mean, I took, you took me on the journey and now, now we're left adrift here. But I'm going to send you, you a sweat pledge. I'm going to send you a sweat pledge, Ben. Okay, sounds good. Well, and, and let's, let's hone in on for a second the, the first principle that you mentioned, which is that 
you won the lottery because you live here, which is something with which I totally agree. But that's a pretty controversial proposition these days. Sure. And it's it's become almost partially a left-right proposition, unfortunately, uh, where you see there, there's a poll that came out just within the last month that suggested that Republicans, particularly, were very proud to be members of the United States, very proud to be American, and they were very proud to be American when Obama was president. This was not dependent on who was president. It was, it was 73% of Americans who were Republicans were proud when Obama was president, and it's 77% now. And for Democrats, it was like 54% were positive when it was Obama, and now it's like 38% because of, of President Trump. Why do you think there are so many people in the country who look at the situation that they've been handed, which is the freest, most prosperous country in the history of humanity, and, and think to themselves, I'm a victim in this scenario. And that, not to discount anybody's actual hardships or past, but why do you think that that's become such a prominent thing in what clearly is a land of opportunity? Because it's not clear. It's not clearly. Right? The big, of all the divides, the one that worries me the most is the divide between people who are genuinely, genuinely convinced that opportunity is dead and those who are not, right? The ones who are artificially convinced or just, you know, paying lip service to it, they don't matter. But there are a lot of people who really and truly, truly believe the system is rigged and they truly believe opportunity is dead. Uh, that's a, they scare me. Um, not because I'm frightened of them, but because that belief is, uh, that, that'll kill us. I mean, if that belief really and truly spreads, it'll kill us. This is why the skills gap becomes weirdly political. It's, it shouldn't be. It's just opportunity. It's just 6.3 million jobs sitting there vacant. But when I point that out, it's, it's very difficult because everything is politicized today, right? It's what comes back is, well, what does the existence of opportunity mean in a country where we're fighting over the fact that opportunity may or may not be dead? It's proof positive that it's not. Now, that's a problem. Right, the optics don't line up. So then you have economic experts with whom I, I, I really can't engage because I'm not an economist, but they will tell you why the skills gap is a myth. So here's how it breaks down. If I point to six million available jobs, my friends on the right will tell me that those jobs are available because human beings are fundamentally lazy. My friends on the left will tell me that those jobs are available because employers are fundamentally greedy. And that's where we are. We can't think beyond the fact that our basic philosophies require us to see humanity as either lazy or greedy. Now, the truth is, in my opinion, we're both lazy and greedy, <laughs> <laughs> right? And we're neither lazy nor greedy. We're all of it and none of it. And all of it gets measured out in unequal amounts. But we don't we don't have time today to parse the nuance of that. It simply has to be one or the other. So when I post a picture of me uh, standing next to the flag on the 4th of July, um, I get a lot of pushback. And I think a lot of people who are pushing me back don't really want to push back. They just don't want to see me doing something patriotic because the lines have been drawn. And now if you're if you're patriotic, well, then you must be on the right. That's also really super dangerous. It's a, it's a false choice, and, and we have to push back against that. We, it's incumbent upon us. I think you're doing a, a decent job of it. I'll try. Thanks. I mean, me. no, honestly, look, you're as biased as I am. You're as biased as the next person, but you can point these cameras at, at anything you want, and you're, you're pointing them at honest, thoughtful conversation. Well, thanks. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, so you have a unique perspective on life. What are your parents like? And this gives you the opportunity to talk a little about your mom because you, you have a brand new book that, that your mom has written that you're pushing right now. So what were your parents like? Well, they're, they were a lot like what happily they still are. Oh, good. Okay. So yeah, my dad is 86 years old. Thank God. Uh, he delivers Meals on Wheels once, sometimes twice a week, and he volunteers at uh, the hospital once a week. Uh, my mom is 80. She still sings in the church choir, and she, and she writes every day. She's been writing me letters for as long as I can remember. Um, I started reading them online, and people started saying, you should write a book, and so she has. Uh, she wrote a book called About My Mother, 
If I were you right now, you know what I'd do? I'd say, I'm going to ask you that question real quick. But first, about my mother, Peggy <laughs> Rowe. It's available at micro.com slash mom's book. Check it out. It'll change your life. And it will. And I mean, look, never mind what the book is about. I mean, it's 14 short stories, and they're all terrific. And anybody who's ever been a mother or a daughter will love it. What's amazing is my mom has written a book at 80. She's 80 years old and just decided, I want to write a book. And it's good. And, you know, I'm so proud of her because, hell, man, I, people half her age with way more opportunity. And, and they don't. She did a thing, you know. My parents are both um, completely engaged with the world around them and still in love with each other. So here's a final question for you before we have to run. Grit and opportunity and, and opportunism and, and enthusiasm and curiosity, these are all the things that you, you like to talk about. Do you think these are inborn qualities in people? Are these things that you can cultivate? Or is it a little bit of both? Because obviously there's some people who, there's a case you made that there are some people who just can't get over that hump. And there are some people who are automatically benefited from birth with, with these qualities. How much of it can be cultivated and how much of it is just that's the way you are? I think all of it can be cultivated. I really do. Look, I think it's, I think change is the hardest thing, but to our earlier point, we come into the world utterly selfish, completely dependent, and totally, totally at the mercy of the people around us. You know, if we don't change from that, <laughs> then, then obviously, right? So yeah, you can cultivate an, uh, a, an outlook of gratitude, you can cultivate um, opportunism. You can also cultivate hypocrisy, and you can cultivate smallness and and meanness. And it's it's I believe some people will always have it easier. Of course, nobody's starting from the from the same starting line. It's okay. It's never been that way, but. It's 100% up to us where we finish. Well, Mike Rose, it's such a pleasure to have you here, and I really appreciate your time. Everybody should go check out your podcast. They should check out your mom's book, everything that, that you're doing. And what, what's the best way to reach you with your website? And, and I'm on Facebook okay. and uh, micro.com. I'm well, hard to miss. Go check it out. Mike Rose, awesome. Thanks so much for stopping by. Appreciate it. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special was produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Associate producers, Mathis Glover and Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And title graphics by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.